talk of uh, uh, today's talk, uh, the diamond bearing kimberlites, a story of extreme magmason dynamics. Uh, so as the talk suggests, I'll be talking about a very particular rock kimberlite. And in particular, I'll be talking about uh, how this uh, particular, uh, this low viscous magma, it ascends to the uh, earth surface uh, following a very extraordinary event uh, during its, uh, from, uh, from its formation to the uh, uh, emplacement. So this is a very brief outline of the talk. Uh, so I'll, uh, first I'll try to define uh, kimberlites and some of the uh, uh, some of the very important things these are, uh, that are related to kimberlites. Then I'll be uh, I'll give a very uh, synoptic flavor of the different research directions and debates that people are uh, currently engaged in connection with kimberlite geology. Uh, then uh, I'll be talking about uh, in detail how we can uh, constrain the extreme ascent speed of kimberlite uh, and, and, and some of the uh, results that I'll be present that will show that what, is, what are the uh, particular conditions that are necessary uh, in, uh, in, the, in the magma storage zone for the initiation of the vertical uh, diking so that the magma can transport to the surface. So firstly, uh, what are kimberlites? Uh, the kimberlites are a, yes, so kimberlites represent a very uh, end member of a very particular complex petrological suite of rock, the other being uh, lamproprites and, and carbonatites. So these are very, uh, very uh, low volume mental derived rocks that are found in some, uh, in almost all the continental cratons in the, in the world. These are uh, defined by the high uh, content of volatiles, particularly carbon dioxide and water, and some uh, some incompatible trace elements. So the basic uh, interest of uh, continuing this uh, study on kimberlite since last maybe like 70, 80 years are primarily driven by uh, by this uh, the economic importance of this value, as it uh, contains almost uh, more than 70 percent of the diamond uh, by value. And also, uh, the during the ascent dynamics, the kimberlites, kimberlitic magma, they carry uh, a xenolith diamond that provide a direct uh, scope to uh, inspect what is the composition and what are the geodynamic uh, properties of the catronic lithosphere as well as the deep uh, mantle part. So uh, I. Uh, the try to give an account of uh, how this kimberlite rock was uh, named and, and and how it was uh, kind of discovered uh, some diamond is something that has uh, fascinated um, mankind for last 4000 years and until almost like 17 10 17 20 most of the almost all the diamonds that were known to mankind were derived from uh, india uh, and and those those were obviously uh, alluvial in origin after the uh, exploration of the new world, uh, subsequent kimberlites were, uh, not kimberlites, diamonds were also mined from uh, some deposits in Brazil, but those di uh, diamonds were also uh, alluvial. The first diamond uh, that are believed to uh, be derived from igneous rock were, were found on the, on, the, on the farms of Kimberley, a place called Kimberley in South Africa. And, and those uh, kimberlites were, uh, were found in some of the uh, uh, areas which in South Africa are called as pens, which represent uh, some of the depressed area, which are muddy, which are, uh, which are muddy. And, and those are, uh, as I told, uh, these are where some of the farms. And when uh, some people were constructing the mud and thatch house, they used to bring this, uh, what they call as yellow uh, mud uh, to prepare their uh, house, huts. Uh, and, and, and some people, well, while they were digging those pens, they discovered, uh, they found rather uh, diamonds, a good amount of diamonds uh, during their digging. And later, uh, when more and diamond uh, were, were found from those areas, people started to dig the, uh, those pens to a great depth. And eventually, they found that uh, what they termed as the yellow ground quickly gave way to uh, some very, uh, some, some, tight and unaltered and some very uh, uh, some good uh, uh, good quality of igneous rock uh, something that they initially termed as blue ground and with uh, uh, when the miners started uh, working seriously around those pens 
it was uh, realized very soon that the blue brown they in fact represents the cylindrical pipeline structures of igneous origin and this is how uh, this rock was named by professor henry lewis uh, with the type area kimberley in a, in a conference probably that was uh, held in uh, manchester in uh, late seven uh, probably 1860 or 1890 that that year i have forgotten but it is around 1870 to 1880 so these were the eventual uh, four uh, big mines which are still active around kimberley that continues to uh, give uh, a good amount of diamonds uh, since like almost like 100 150 years so so now i'll talk about uh, the spatio temporal distribution of kimberlites around the globe so uh, these uh, kimberlites are found in almost all the cratonic seals which are uh, 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 which are older which are uh, some uh, newer key onto proterozoic in their age mostly so uh, yes talking about the spatio temporal distribution of the kimberlites uh, so it has been observed that kimberlites are found almost every continent on the earth and almost about 3000 uh, kimberlitic deposits that have, that have been uh, recorded till now are found within some stable continent, uh, continental parts uh, like archean cratons or early proterozoic lithosphere uh, and, and 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 a rule was the uh, kind of uh, thumb rule was given uh, by uh, wh which is popularly known as clifford rule that suggests the uh, the the occurrence of uh, kimberlite with the cratonic seals around the globe although that rule is not geodynamically very uh, well uh, well studied but but that rule is still being used so recent studies, it suggests that uh, the increasing oxidation state and the volatile content uh, in the upper mantle due to the, uh, due to the uh, with, with, with cooling of the, your, your uh, arts mantle, so it led to the increasing uh, production of the kimberlitic magma and their emplacement during the post archean uh, subduction recycling. And, and talking about the temporal variation, so if you see, uh, if you see this uh, this red line, so this this highlights the uh, the evolution of the thickness of the continental crust with time, and and and, and this uh, increase and decrease of the continental thickness uh, it, it has been directly linked with the uh, with the uh, kimberlitic volcanism. So some studies suggest that uh, in the last almost a uh, hundred million years, continental crust. Uh, crustal growth it has been affected by uh, what is known as lithospheric destruction due to the uh, cooling of the uh, earth and, and the cool subduction that took over uh, the, uh, the, uh, due to the cooler mental temperatures. And, and this particular event, it, it, it resulted in deeper subduction and a more kind of efficient recycling of the continental crust. So these are evident by the occurrence of the, or the, or the peak that we observe, as we can see here, what is known as kimberlitic boom in the last uh, almost like 250 to 300 years uh, during the breakup and the eventual uh, uh, sorry the you know you know your union and an eventual breakup of the gondwana and the Pangea supracontinental cycle also uh, there is a particular event uh, that people are more and more connecting the observation of the or the occurrence of the kimberlite with this uh, your your thickness of the uh, this temporal evolution of the thickness and that being that which continued super cycling, uh, your, your uh, supracontinent recycling, the tectonic stress, it continued to accumulate in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the thick continental parts relative to the other younger or, or, or thinner parts. And this uh, storage or the memory, what is uh, termed as the, your damage memory in the, in the lithosphere, that uh, kinds of gives and structural avenues uh, due to the uh, due to the uh, concentration of the weak zones as lineaments that I'll be describing in detail, uh, not detail. I'll, I'll highlight in one of the slide. So those fissures have uh, have, have led to the some some uh, some of the observed temporal distribution of the magma, uh, cumulative magma in the in the last 200 to uh, 300 million years. So now uh, going for a kimberlitic a proper kimberlitic definition. So, so, so this uh, definition is not straightforward. Like most of the rocks that uh, 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 most of the normal igneous uh, rock, uh, and in fact, the definition uh, has not been constrained fully 
with respect to the geochemistry and the isotope geology. However, uh, in, 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 in talking about a, a very randomly, kimberlites represent a group of silica undersaturated uh, rock that is quite rich in olivine, where the model percent, uh, percentage of the olivine almost reaches up to 50%. And as I told probably, it is formed uh, by the mantle derived magma. And these magma are characterized by high uh, volatile content, uh, especially carbon dioxide and water that are uh, present uh, uh, to, uh, to a fraction of as good as 10% to 5% by weight percentage. And also these are potassium, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is represented by less than 0.5 weight percent of sodium oxide and about 3% of potassium oxide. And also this rock, rock is, a, a, is deficient in aluminum, dioxide, aluminum oxide, sorry. And this hybrid rock is, 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 is consists of three basic components. So the first is the magmatic phases that represents the products of the parental male uh, and, 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 and the eventual crystallization product from this, uh, uh, this primitive emeralitic male. And the second part is the mantle and the crustal xenocris that are entrapped during, uh, within the uh, kimberlitic magma when they find their uh, uh, way to the, to the surface of the earth by, by violently cracking the country rock through which it uh, passes through. And third is the hydrothermal and the alteration product uh, uh, which, are, which, which forms after the emplacement is, is over on the, on the surface due to the activities triggered by the presence of fluids or even some, sometimes uh, uh, this, this uh, alteration like serpentinization and carbonization, they are also attributed to the some of the free automagnetic uh, magmatic activities that, that, that affects the, uh, the emplacement mechanism during the almost uh, during the end part of the, of the emplacement. So uh, as I uh, told, uh, this kimberlite is not a straightforward rock to define. Initially, uh, Wagner, way back uh, to 1914, uh, so he kind of uh, uh, came up with a uh, very uh, different uh, approach to define uh, kimberlite, and that he did with the observation of two different types of kimberlites that he termed as basaltic and lamproprietic because of the uh, close proximity of some of the rocks that it uh, shows with, the, with the, this basaltic or, or especially the ocelline uh, island basalts. The, 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 these two varieties of rock eventually was termed as group one and group two. This group one, what is typically known as archetypical kimberlite, that has a global presence, whether the second type is or group two, these are also uh, known as orangitides because of the type area that was found uh, along the Orange River in uh, Africa. Uh, uh, so this group one uh, kimberlite, so they are recognized by abundant olivine and ground mass perovskite, spinel, monticellite, uh, uh, this uh, or, or even calcite sometimes, whereas the group two is is dominantly defined by the uh, sorry dominant presence of the phologopite mineral as a major constituent. Uh, there are a great deal of petrological differences between the group one and group two kimberlites, and and and, and in fact the difference is sometimes so obvious that uh, most of the petrologists they now believe that this group one and group two kimberlite should not be called as kimberlite. In, in fact, sorry, this group two should not be termed as uh, kimberlite because it shows much closer affinity to lampropites than kimberlites. Also, these two rocks are, 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 are different in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, geodynamic viewpoint as the group was, are believed to be derived, derived from some deep seated asthenospheric mantle in contrast to group two uh, uh, kimberlite, which are derived from metasomatized lithospheric mantle. And despite these two rocks being uh, almost different, <coughs> the geologists are still following this. Uh, most of the I saw, even recent publications, they also uh, uh, use this term group one and group two kimberlite instead of the modern names that have been uh, given to this rock. So now talking about the different, uh, your, 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 uh, Cases and the types of uh, or classes of rather kimberlite that are commonly associated with the excavation and the, and, the, and the, uh, also in the academic point of view. Uh, talking about the faces, the kimberlite faces uh, can be represented by three contrasting uh, type of faces. The uh, uh, with respect to where it is found uh, in, in the earth surface or within the earth surface. 
So the three phases are, are termed as crater phases, diatrium phases, and the hypervasal phases. These crater phases are represented by lavas, pyroclastic rocks, and some volcanoclastic or volcanogenic sedimentary deposits, which uh, mostly forms uh, uh, soon after the emplacement is over. On the other hand, the diatrium phases, it is found in the kimberlitic pipe, the, the inverted or, or, or this carrot shaped geometry uh, of, the, of the what is also known as pipe that contains almost the entire diatrium phases is composed of angular or sometimes rounded xenolith class uh, and it also contains a good amount of volcanoclastic kimberlite. On the other hand, hyper uh, hypervessel phases of the kimberlites they are, 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 are defined by two different uh, rock type. One is hypervessel kimberlite and the other is hypervessel kimberlite brexia. Uh, and, 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 and most of the studies, they classify the kimberlite occurrence in terms of uh, three classes. They term it as class one, class two, class three. So in class one kimberlite are the most dominant type of kimberlite occurrence that we uh, that is observed around the globe. And it contains the distinct preservation of root pipe and crater zones. However, recent studies uh, suggest that not all craters or, or rather kimberlite deposits, they so or they can be represented with well-developed or well-preserved geometries of root pipes and craters. Depending on that, some studies a term class two kimberlite where the pipe and the roots are not well preserved and uh, your, your, your diatrim, the, the craters are, are mostly bowel or dissipate. On the other hand, the class three pipes are, 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 are essentially defined uh, if the, it, the craters are, are, are mostly represented by the re sedimented volcanoclastic uh, deposits. So, so now I'll be talking about uh, some of the major agenda, academic agenda uh, that people are pursuing uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, people are pursuing to understand and explain some of the enigmatic issues which are still to be uh, uh, to be to be uh, to be fully constrained. The first uh, problem that 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 uh, that troubles the uh, geologist uh, in connection with kimberlite is that 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 uh, what are the composition of the primitive kimberlite mill because till now uh, 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 because we cannot see the eruption of the kimberlitic mill not even that well preserved lava fossil lava of kimberlite is also virtually absent anywhere in the world so uh, due to these complexities the composition of the primitive kimberlite are 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 yet to be fully developed however the existing studies they uh, while they try to emphasize or while they try to determine the, the parent kimberlitic mix, uh, males, they need to do uh, they, they, this, this approach. It follows uh, two distinct uh, methods. In one of the uh, methods, and the most uh, common method is that uh, people do the correction for the periodotides because the, the main problem in defining the kimberlite males or source is that the most of the kimberlites are highly altered and they are uh, they, are, they, are, they are severely uh, affected by the post emplacement uh, tectonic activities, tecton tectonic as well as your, your uh, petrological, uh, your, your metamorphic events. So when people, when, when, when we correct for the periodotite present in the kimberlite uh, rocks, so it, it gives a, sil uh, a, 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 a silico carbonatite parental male, which is rich in water, carbon dioxide, and they are very low to moderate uh, they, they contain low to moderate uh, silica and, and also they contain low uh, uh, K2O and very low sodium oxide. On the other hand, the, uh, uh, the, another, uh, the another, another dominant uh, your macro trees that is present in the chemolytic male, which is olivine. So if we make some adjustment on the olivine, then uh, uh, another completely different type of source male is, is obtained, which becomes silica poor water poor uh, calcium magnesium uh, carbonatite. So with a good amount of uh, good enrichment of sodium uh, uh, and, and some some other, other minor elements. Moreover, uh, along with the defining the parental kimberlite mill, it is also quite hard to make a, a concrete comment on the what could be the source characteristic with respect to the kimberlite uh, mill. So although we are more or less certain that the 
kimberlites are derived from the asthenospheric mantle with a dominant composition of logopite, dolomite, garnet, azolite composition. Uh, how this particular composition uh, melted uh, to, to give rise to kimberlitic melt is still debated. And, and, and this debate is so strong that some of the studies, this, they, they, they strongly indicate that to generate kimberlite, the partial melting that is required is essentially low, that is less than 1% volume of partial melting. On the other hand, uh, very conclusive evidence have also been given that need to have a high, uh, uh, a high fraction of partial melting uh, up to 20% by volume to generate the kimberlitic magma. Yes, so the, the second uh, uh, problem that, 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 uh, that is related to kimberlite is the source. Although it is more or less certain that the, uh, that the males are formed or, or, or the kimberlite magma generates at a depth not less than 150 kilometer, uh, uh, beyond 150 kilometer, the source of the kimberlite can, can greatly vary. Uh, so in this diagram, if you see, uh, there are four possible uh, loci of kimberlite source. The first one, uh, uh, these are quite uh, uh, quite deep. So some studies suggest that the origin of this, uh, uh, your, your kimberlitic magma could be as low as 670, 680 kilometer that correspond to the almost top part of the lower mantle. And on the other, on the other hand, uh, On the other hand, uh, the other studies that suggest that the kimberlitic magmas are, are, are almost uh, connected with the deep subduction. Sub, uh, when the subducting slabs, it, it, it intrudes into the, into the transition zone. So the, because of the melting that occurs on the subduction zone, it releases volatiles and these volatiles lowers the uh, melting point of the, or, or, the, or, the, or the lowers the solidus, thereby generating kimberlitic magma. Another two models, they are connected with, uh, with, the, with the generation of the, of the, of the kimberlitic magma around the, uh, at the base of the lithospheric kill, uh, which is uh, situated at a depth of 190 to 200 kilometer. And on the other hand, the, the, what is termed as four here, they are shown by this, this pink color. Uh, and this is one of the oldest uh, idea that was proposed way back in the uh, uh, 1970s during the during the very uh, development of plate tectonics theory uh, professor morgan he says said that the kimberlitic magmas although they generate fully generate at the the the, uh, the, the boundary between the asthenospheric boundary uh, uh, lithospheric asthenospheric boundary however the essential ingredients that are required for this uh, volcanism are are derived or or are, are, are carried forward in the by the convecting man, uh, mantle in the form of mantle plumes so till now, uh, all the people are, are saying that uh, one of the uh, one of these four sources can well explain the the, the the source of the kimberlite in the, in the magma. There are still uh, uh, debates that which model we should follow or, or or whether a particular kimberlite deposit can be attributed to one or more of this geodynamic uh, scenario. Now. Uh, Now, now this uh, 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 results that suggest that the, the geological triggers because because uh, once we form the kimberlitic magma, we still need to have a, a a good trigger geological trigger that will drive the kimberlite magmatism. So the distinctive triggers, the uh, geologic triggers uh, that have been advocated range from plumes uh, and mantle hotspot tracks to deep subduction or recycle slab and the convecting mantle beneath the continents. And also I'll show that the changes in the far field stresses associated with, associated with the plate tectonics are, are also uh, possible candidates for as, as the geological triggers. Uh, the, the image on the, on the, on the left-hand side uh, is, is a remarkable example that kind of links the mantle plume hotspot track and the formation of the kimberlitic magma. Uh, so it is, it is the great meteor track uh, the magmatism along this continental portion of the Great Meteor Tech, so the, 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 this, this bar, it represents the shear seismic velocity. And then this uh, particular study, recent study, they, sized, uh, they, they came up with a, 
a very smart idea to link this uh, velocity with the, with the thickness of the uh, uh, lithospheric uh, thickness of the lithosphere. So they propose that the magnetism along the continental portion of the great meteor hotspot track spans more than 120 million years, and it includes kimberlites. If you see here, the kimberlites are shown by the white uh, uh, white numbers and KLT, AT, FL. So these are the different uh, uh, locations where uh, a risk, uh, your, your, your diamond bearing kimberlite has been reported. So these uh, uh, all kimberlite deposits, they follow a almost southeast uh, younging direction and the kimberlite magmatism dominates the northwest portion here. Uh, this, this, this about CAs uh, at, a, at, a, at a time duration of 225 uh, MA. So, so this uh, part have been dominated by the, uh, are, are represented by where the continental lithosphere is thickest within this particular domain. However, it is still debated the exact location of the great meteor track uh, and, and whether two mental uh, plumes like and, and the resulting uh, from the great meteor as well as the harder track, whether it caused across quickly within this, uh, within this corridor in a geologically uh, short interval. On the right hand side, so this result, uh, this, this, it is quite old study. So this study suggests that the subduction of the oceanic lithosphere beneath southern Africa led to the formation of the, uh, led to the uh, Kimberlite magmatism. So it is, they propose that before 130, 140 million years, Kimberlites are restricted, as you can see here, uh, on the eastern part of the Gondwana in South Africa. However, after the opening of the South Atlantic at a, at a, at a time of about 130 million years, uh, which is of course related to this uh, supracontinent cycle, uh, so it foundered the oceanic lithosphere beneath the southern Africa. And because of this foundering of the oceanic lithosphere, uh, so it led to the heating up of, uh, heating up of the particular foundering lithosphere in an up deep direction. And, 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 and since the, the, the heating of this foundered lithosphere uh, happened from, uh, from the, uh, in an up deep direction, so it, 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 is, it is correlated with the younging direction, westward younging direction, as you see here, uh, of the cumulative magma on the, on the surface. Now, uh, now, these slides, it shows the controls of the tectonics. So what are the tectonic controls that are necessary uh, for the, for the uh, kimberlite magmatism? So here, uh, I must say that this particular model is not only uh, valid for kimberlites, but this similar model has also been applied to, uh, to, to, to address some of the occurrence of other related log, rocks like uh, lampropikes. So these studies, so I'm not going into detail of these studies. So, so they, 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 they conclusively show that the, the, the intrusive of this uh, alkaline suite of rock, the preferential uh, happen with the association of some deep basement Hello. Hmm. Yes, I'm yes, yes, we can hear you, but you need to share your slide. Okay, no, no, actually, uh, one of my students told it, uh, his, uh, my voice was not uh, audible. No, no, it was okay. No, it is loud and clear, Amira. No problem. Okay, okay, okay. The audio is clear. Okay. No, I just uh, asked him uh, to say if there is anything wrong. He told that he could not listen to what I was saying. Anyway. No, it's okay. Fine. Go ahead. Can you see Sandeep? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. So, so, so what I was saying uh, that, that uh, for this uh, particular uh, uh, enigmatic magmatism, so it requires a preferential association with the deep basement structures. So that, uh, that, 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 uh, that can be of different types. For example, the one in the left hand side, it shows that the kimberlite uh, yeah, magmatism are preferentially occurring along some linear lineament, which are nothing but the uh, but, the, uh, but the continental continuation of the uh, oceanic uh, fracture zones, which, are, uh, which can be linked with the transform fall or, or the fracture zones related to the transform fall. Not the transform fall, sorry, but the fracture zone associated with the, with the transform fall boundary. The, 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 similarly, uh, the other deep, uh, some deep structures like some any fractures, falls or mobile zones 
uh, or, 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 or people uh, in, 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 uh, in, in uh, previously people related the occurrence of the Kimberlites uh, to what was previously known as Ologazens or, or, or we can simply say that these are nothing but some linear gravens which attained a particular uh, uh, attained a particular weakness in their uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, consisting rock strength. So the, the conclusion is that we need to have a preferential association with the deep basement structures uh, for any kimberlitic magma regime. So that means a mere uh, production of kimberlitic magma at a suitable depth would not lead to the magmatic event. For that, we need to have some uh, some 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 uh, weak zones we should be supplied or we should be uh, uh, we should be uh, we should be derived from the from the uh, far field tectonic stress uh, due to uh, different uh, tectonic activities. So now, uh, throughout this uh, second half, I'll be uh, I'll be talking specifically about the very unique style of SN mechanism of kimberlitic magma. So, 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 so this kimberlitic volcanism. Uh, so, so, so it involves the ascent of extremely low uh, uh, viscosity melt. So viscosity of the kimberlitic magma has been found to be ranged uh, to as low as 0.1 Pascal second. And sometimes it goes up to 10 to uh, 15 tens of uh, Pascal second uh, in viscosity. So this low viscosity and volatile risk ultra basic magma. So which uh, starts their journey from a depth of uh, at least 150 kilometer. So they, they need uh, uh, a, a very uh, special type of ascent behavior uh, for their uh, Ascent. So the recent studies suggest that the ascent uh, happens along very narrow dikes, uh, and, and, and the velocity is, is quite good, quite high, and, 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 and uh, that velocity has been modeled as uh, in, uh, to occur between 4 to 20 meters per second. However, some of the studies suggest that the, the velocity can be as high as sometimes 100 to 130 meters per second in uh, event. Also, the magma, magma supply rates are estimated in the range of 100 to 100,000 meter cube per second. And, and, the, and the eruption uh, duration, it, it varies uh, from some hours to some months. So it is quite uh, quick in, uh, in, in relation to the other, uh, other, other uh, ascent, uh, ascent of other uh, magma. So the, 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 the why, uh, what sustain or what particular events uh, is, 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 is prevailing on the, on the magma source zone that facilitates the fast ascent mechanism. And, and, and two particular models has been, has been given by, by, uh, by recent studies. So the first uh, model, they consider the exolution of the volatile uh, fraction, which is present in the, in the, in the magma. So it, it triggers a kind of uh, assimilation of the silicate materials. And because of this exolution, it, 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 it sustains the high energy it is required for the, uh, for the very fast movement of this low viscous magma. The second model, it considers the buoyancy effects, which is uh, because uh, which is intrinsic to the uh, carbonate risk male composition. So in the next few slides, uh, I'll be talking about, uh, or rather I'll try to give an account of constraining the SN rates through some experimental results and, uh, and, 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 and some possible explanation about what could be the pattern of uh, tensile stress localization around the magma chamber that can facilitate magma uh, fracture formation for the uh, vertical uh, magma ascent. So to do the first part, uh, what we did, we did some uh, multi-anvil experiments. Uh, and this facility, uh, I used the facility present in uh, uh, NCMP, National Center for Experimental Minerals and Petrology in Allahabad University. So this multi-anvil uh, 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 apparatus uh, that I use is a, is a particular class of device that has been designed to achieve static high pressure and temperature. The apparatus uh, uh, probably gets its name from the anvils uh, that I'll discuss. Uh, that are, these are the anvils, uh, the pictures are not that great. So, so these anvils are utilized. So this, I'll, I'll describe these anvils. So these anvils are, are utilized to achieve pressure by compressing, uh, compressing uh, from uh, a, a, by giving an inward uh, movement. So these uh, multi-anvil experiment they are sometimes called as large volume press, 
as the volumes which are uh, used to uh, in this uh, setup is uh, quite large in comparison with the diamond and bill cell. So although the sample size is large, so that kind of hinders the achievement of high pressure and temperature. But on the high side, because of this high uh, large size of the sample, uh, the pressure and the temperature that are that are achieved is 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 although far less than that of uh, diamond and bill cell, it offers a uniform and reliable pressure temperature conditions during the experiments. The conventional uh, uh, multi and bill uh, apparatus that I use uh, can attain a pressure almost in the range of 4 to 25 uh, GPA uh, or say 4 to, uh, 40 to 250 uh, kilobar. And this uh, pressure, especially the temperature is not a big deal that we can. Uh, uh, Reaching high temperature is quite easy, uh, but but uh, to attain uh, this high pressure, so it depends on what kind of uh, anvils we are using, and and what are the strength of the anvil, and what kind of support we are giving uh, to the uh, pressure module. Anyway, I'm not uh, going much into detail. So this particular uh, device that I'm talking about consists of three important parts. The one is hydraulic press, which is uh, you can see the, the 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 blue green color, bright blue color. The other is the pressure module uh, and then a cell assembly. So, so this is the uh, this is the your your high pressure uh, module. So, high pressure module uh, the high pressure module uh, kind of uh, so this is the high pressure module. Uh, so, so so if I can show you the high pressure module is put inside this uh, hydraulic press. So, this part uh, if you can. Just a minute. So this part, so this part is the, is the uh, high pressure module. So this high pressure module, uh, high pressure module, uh, it, it converts the one-way forward motion, uh, which is uh, which is sustained by the vertical movement of the hydraulic ram into an inward movement. Because once you move this uh, ram upward, this ram I am talking about, this this cylinder, this 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 particular cylinder, big cylinder at the bottom of the hydraulic press. So once you move it. So the, this hydraulic press is designed to uh, kind of uh, convert this uh, this this uh, upward movement into a reactive force to the high pressure module, and this pressure module, uh, as I am talking about, as talking about, it converts the one-way forward motions of the hydraulic ram into inward movement because of the uh, the end wheels moves in a inward direction. In a in a in a, in a typical uh, Walker type end wheel uh, that. Uh, was used in this uh, study. Uh, we uh, used a split cylindrical uh, cluster. So these are the split cylindrical clusters. If you see here, so there are six cylindrical, uh, split uh, cylindrical clusters, uh, which are used to hold the uh, your 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 uh, sample capsule. And this this uh, the strength of the uh, uh, this this uh, clusters need to be quite high so that the 25 GPA kind of pressure can be sustained during the experiment. And the pressure cell, uh, so so this sample cell, so this is critical to uh, uh, successful completion of the, of the high pressure temperature experiment as it generates the desired pressure in the sample system. And also this this sample capsule, so yes, so this sample capsule, which is uh, placed within this uh, anvil. So these are the again I'm talking about. This is the this is the split uh, cylindrical clusters. So these are the this Rubik cube kind of things, uh, two by two Rubik cube kind of things are the are the, are the, are the anvils, and between this uh, corner of the anvils, uh, we put the sample capsule. So this sample capsule, uh, so so it it helps in achieving the desired pressure, and it also uniformly uh, 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 uniform uh, 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 spread of the pressure within the within the sample. The octahedron kind of uh, uh, that that pressure cell that uh, that that are used in the multi anvil cell uh, have integrated fins. If you see here, so these are the fins. Uh, so these fins I'm talking about. So these fins are are are, are designed uh, in a way so that they they, they become soft uh, during the experiment because of the pressure as well as the temperature. And these fins it spreads and uniformly uh, uh, as uh, uniformly fills up. The whatever small spaces are, are are present within this individual eight numbers of anvils. So during an experiment, the, these fins 
they 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 excuses as i was talking about and it kind of uh, facilitate the movement of the anvils first and secondly they they kind of provides an insulating material so if there was some loophole uh, in the in the in the in the electrical connection then this gasket fins this uh, this this uh, which are bad conducts of of, 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 of of voltage electrical signals so they act as the uh, they, 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 they ensures that the electrical uh, connections are, are, are uh, holds good during the experiment. So this uh, on, the, on the right hand side, uh, this is a uh, section, cross section of this particular uh, uh, pressure cell. So two of the number two represents the 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 the, the split clusters. The three are the, are the sample capsule. Four is the sample. Five are the, are the very high strength uh, uh, cover, uh, one at the top, one at the bottom, and one and the six are the, are the outer uh, support to the to the uh, this pressure module. And this is the anatomy of the uh, of the of the sample. That I'm not going to uh, talk uh, detail about how this uh, sample was put and 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 and, and uh, how we uh, uh, how what are the different components. However, uh, very uh, roughly speaking, inside we can see the sample here this is the sample so this sample is is is, is placed within an uh, within a, within a magnesium oxide and this magnesium oxide uh, uh, this cylinder made up of magnesium oxide is placed within within the graphite heater and again this graphite heater is placed to an external uh, magnesium oxide filter so that the, uh, the, the 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 heater remains uniformly heated during the experiment also to ensure the uh, electrical connection between the anvils and the heater, uh, two molybdenum discs, one at the top, one at the bottom, as you can see here, are placed. And, uh, and to reduce the electrical resistance, uh, uh, a layer of graphite layer uh, uh, on, 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 uh, along with the, along with the um, uh, your, your molybdenum is also used. <clears throat> and we, we, we drill a hole at one end of the molybdenum and, and we inserted a plug uh, so that the uh, it gives an uh, place to to to, uh, to 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 put the uh, thermocouple and the other connections that are required for the uh, electrical uh, resistivity measurement that we did in the study. So this shows an uh, pressure temperature calibration that was used in the study. So bismuth uh, transition from bismuth one to bismuth two and bismuth three to bismuth uh, four was used for the pressure calibration. And the melting of quartz, coesite, diopside melting, and silver uh, melting was used as uh, was, was used to calibrate the temperature. And and and, and this is the experimental sample. This is an uh, uh, the this table. It shows an uh, electropore microanalysis of the different elements that were uh, that were prepared synthetically as the as the as the fluorocopite uh, peridotype system rock as proposed by Wiley. Uh, as, as the uh, as, as a possible source rock of the kimberlite, although there are some arguments on this. Uh, so 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 all the uh, uh, everything that was used as a sample were 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 synthetically prepared. So uh, these are the materials that I uh, that we used uh, uh, as the, as the sample material. And we also in in each of the ex experiment, a small naturally occurring diamond grain was placed. So these are experimental technique that uh, was 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 uh, uh, that was uh, uh, followed during the experiment. So the pressure and the temperature uh, during the experiment was uh, was maintained at six GPA to about thirteen fifty to four hundred degrees centigrade, which is, which lies above the diamond graphite uh, graphite uh, your your uh, stability diagram. And also this uh, uh, this uh, pressure temperature regime is also above the solidus so i must uh, tell that this uh, this king type of curve that you are that you are uh, looking at this bowl king type of curve so this is the uh, solidus of this particular sample material uh, when we incorporate a good amount of volatile materials in absence of or or, or if the uh, if, the, if the sample was dry the normal solidus would, would follow a this kind of uh, path so this is not shown here uh, so we consider uh, and the experiment was 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 uh, done for a time period of half an hour almost uh, at, 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 the, at this particular pressure temperature condition, and the and and, and we use three different uh, paths. So so as uh, first curve, second curve, and third curve. So these are the PT paths 
along which the pressure temperature was 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 changed or rather it was decreased during the experiment to simulate the ascent behavior of the uh, 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 of the kimberlitic magma during their upward ascent so 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 uh, uh, again just to say if you see uh, during uh, the two main uh, set of experiment represented by first curve and the second curve the pressure and the temperature was decrease uh, decrease very sharply so from a pressure temperature uh, pressure of say uh, 6 gpa the pressure was reduced to 3 gpa almost instantly and from 3 gpa it was gradually cool along uh, two specific parts that have been uh, that uh, that i have shown here just a minute yes so oh yes the third part you see or along the third part the the pressure and the temperature was was uh, was decreased monotonically just to test the experiment and uh, there is a particular uh, 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 reason why we we decrease the pressure and the temperatures uh, temperature very sharply uh, until 3 gpa because this particular pressure condition uh, and and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, depressurization of the of the sample almost isothermally so it was done because uh, the abrupt change in the in the in the uh, in this particular pt uh, variation is to uh, is to is to is to incorporate the particular pressure temperature regime where the kimberlite magmas are believed that they started crystallizes so at a at a, at a depth that correspond to 3 gpa say about say uh, 130 140 150 kilometer depending on the other uh, parameters so this is the uh, thermodynamic condition that is essential for the uh, crystallization of the of the, of the uh, magma at a, at a temperature of about uh, three uh, sorry pressure of 3 gpa and temperature around 12 to 1250 degrees uh, uh, centigrade. So beyond that, after that, the pressure and the temperature was decreased, decreased uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very slow manner uh, by, uh, by, by, by and, 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 and this decrease from this king, from this 3 GPA uh, condition, the pressure was, uh, was, 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 was continuously decreased uh, uh, by, by, by simulating uh, four different types of ascent speed because the essential aim of this experiment was to constrain the ascent speed. So we, uh, we, we lowered the, or we depressurized the sample uh, so that the, uh, the, the, the particular experiment, it mimics the ascent speed of four different types. Uh, and it varies from 10 meter per second to 3.3 meter per second almost. So these are the results that we obtained. So the results clearly shows that there is a particular, uh, particular, uh, and obviously I, I, I forgot to, uh, I probably forgot to mention that when we depressurize this this sample containing the diamond, this diamond will 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 uh, will will, uh, will start to graphitize. So no matter how we uh, depressurize, uh, some amount of diamond will 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 obviously be uh, uh, converted to graphite. So. Uh, there is a particular link, as you can see in the table, as well as in the plot below, that there is a clear cut link between the uh, ascent rate of the uh, kimberlitic magmas and the uh, graphitization that 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 uh, that occurs in a particular experiment. So, if you see uh, the for a particular curve, so you can see we did four experiment along the first curve, second uh, four experiment again along the second curve. Uh, we did three, uh, two experiments along the third curve because that was not very uh, geologically relevant, this third curve. This was just a test that we did. Uh, you can see it, it was almost a pilot experiment. So, so, however, all the experiments that we performed, it shows that the graphitization, that the, uh, the, the graphitization uh, uh, increases with the, with, the, with the lowering of the, of the ascent velocity. That means if we uh, allow the particular sample to depressurize along a, 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 a particular uh, depressurizing path that that mimics the ascent velocity of 10 meter per second so nine percent of the of the graphite only nine percent of the of the uh, bi volume uh, diamond is gets converted into graphite on the other hand along the same pt path if you allow the sample to depressurize mimicking a ascent velocity of about three meter per second then you can see that almost 46 47 percent of the uh, diamond is graphitized. 
the same thing we can see uh, for other two part as well so so this uh, uh, this electrical resistivity if you plot against the gravitation uh, uh, so it shows a, a almost a linear plot irrespective of the of the part or the or, or, the, or the style of the experiment that we choose to so this uh, uh, this this can be represented by another uh, plot that if you uh, the same uh, almost the same data has been plotted against the, uh, uh, the, the against the SN rate so you can clearly see that with decreasing the SN rate, the gravitation increases. So this result was also supported by in situ resistivity measurements. So that you can see on the, on the right hand panel. So the uh, the one and two, the Roman one and Roman two on the left hand panel, it correspond to uh, the first curve, the extreme two uh, uh, two 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 uh, points. So probably the, yes, this one. So this one, Roman one, it represented this point. That is the sample uh, that was cooled along the first curve and that was allowed to uh, ascend. Uh, that, was, that was conditioned to radar, that, that was conditioned to ascend at a uh, speed of 10 meter per second. So that is, uh, we, we can see that when we uh, lower this ascent velocity from 10 to about three, then the amount of the gravitation that 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 occurred during the experiment it also increased the similar result can be shown for this three and four uh, they represent the the two plots for the second curve so so to summarize the the experimental results uh it it, it strongly advocate that the the kimberlatic magmas can only retain good amount of diamond only when they ascend with a threshold velocity and our experiment it, it suggests that we need to have a minimum of about three meter per second uh, uh, speed of uh, ascend, uh, ascending kimberlite to to uh, to to preserve uh, appreciable amount of diamond. Otherwise, the most of the diamond will be graphitized during their upward journey. So we we kind of uh, perform some analytical uh, exercise. So the aim of this analytical uh, uh, exercise was to kind of give some support to the to the to the to the uh, to the estimate that we achieved in the in the our uh, extreme uh, our laboratory experiment so for that we 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 uh, we use two standard uh, equations or two standard approaches that people mostly use to to constrain the the settling rate of xenoliths so that means so if you can imagine if you allow some xenoliths to ascend in a uh, in a fluid that is itself is 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 is, is, is ascending the the, the 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 general tendency of the xenoliths if they are if their size is quite good if they are extremely small then this equation is, is is will not be valid however if the xenoliths are somewhat bigger in the in the range of about 5 to 10 or bigger than that centimeter so these xenoliths they will need to uh, they will they will they will try to settle because of the gravity because these xenoliths will be denser than the than the uh, than the, than the then a fluid uh, phase that will entrain this xenolith and the ascent velocity of the of the of the of the fluid phase have to be more than the settling rate of the xenoliths so for that uh, depending on the viscosity of the of the of the uh, fluid phase that uh, that one is interested so we can have two equations one for the uh, low Reynolds number laminar flow other uh, for the other uh, if the Reynolds number is 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 more that that represents a turbulent state of flow so two equations can be given so we uh, use both this equation uh, that is one for the laminar flow at the top and uh, and and uh, somewhat more complicated equation uh, at the bottom representing the turbulent flow regime so we try to uh, uh, do some simple exercise uh, uh, about the calculation of this, uh, yeah, the, the minimum rate along which the magma needs to ascend so that they can carry the xenoliths along with them. So both this analysis, it shows that and the data that we considered uh, for this, uh, for our analytical exercise are extremely consistent with, with almost all the uh, research uh, that have been done with this uh, particular direction. So both these approaches uh, the laminar as well as the turbulent flow this suggests that the 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 the, the, the ascent velocity of the of the magma the, the the which is being kimberlite here so it has to happen at a at a at a threshold value of uh 
three meter per second almost. If the if the ascent velocity is is less than that, they won't be successful in carrying the uh, this xenoliths uh, uh, along with them. So that means you can see that the xenolith side that we that we consider have a dimension of about fifteen centimeter. So these are quite uh, quite quite uh, large uh, uh, pure macrocrysts or or, or xenoliths that are present in the cumulatic rock. So to have this kind of inclusions. Uh, the, 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 the magma has to ascend uh, at this particular velocity. So the other analytical approach, uh, we did uh, the transport equation of the viscous magma. So that means what could be the, uh, the, the transport equations of the, of the uh, magma, considering again both the laminar state and the turbulent uh, state. So we followed the uh, very well acceptable model given by Spence and Targote. Uh, way back in 1990 and both this uh, equation so if we if we uh, uh, use the standard parameters associated with the kimberlite volcanism so this suggests that the uh, your 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 uh, uh, the, the ascent velocity of the magma is is uh, need to be say about 10 meter per second so that means we can say the lower threshold so this is somewhat higher than what we estimated in our uh, laboratory experiments as well as the uh, from the settling rate of the xenoliths so so this settling rate of the xenoliths it supports our experimental findings uh, that the threshold that the minimum velocity that that uh, that we need to have in the in the flowing magma cumulative magma has to be around uh, a minimum of three meter per second in less than that the kimberlites perhaps would not carry these xenoliths and 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 and, and these diamonds could be very well uh, could be a very uh, uh, very standard uh, variation of the, of the xenoliths. So uh, on a uh, yes, so so now I'll be talking about uh, some of the very well accepted model. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll quickly describe two well accepted models uh, which are uh, which have been uh, proposed recently. That 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 uh, that. Uh, kind of predicts or that kind of models what are the necessary conditions that are required uh, for the uh, kimberlite volcanism so so this model given by wilson and head uh, in 2007 so they they consider a, a deep carbon dioxide rich source as the as the kimberlite magma and they consider that when the this fluid phase exhausts from the from the from the uh, or depressurizes during the airport journey, what they form because of the exolution, they, they, they produce as a magmatic foam. That is the carbon dioxide phase, it, it separates out from the fluid phase and the immediate fluid phase that is in connection with the, the carbon dioxide is in the form of a kind of, you can say, magmatic foam. So once the fracture reaches the surface, the basic idea of the model is that what happens after the, uh, the, the, this, this diking, it, it reaches the surface. So according to this model, once the uh, crack, once the dike, it, it reaches the surface, it releases the, obviously the gas would, would release and gas would release, of course, very violently. And because of the violent explosion, violent emission of this, of this, of this uh, low viscous fluid, the, the, in fact, the, the, the volatile phase, it will produce a kind of depressurization wave in the, in the, in the, in the trailing fluid phase. And this depressurization wave, uh, wave is so enormous in their in their in their in their magnitude is that this particular wave, elastic wave of almost, it will break apart the dike wall, and, and 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 this process, according to this particular model, they happens they they take place in a very short uh, span of time. A model which is consistent with most of the uh, of, the, of, the, of the observations that are made, that that can be made in the in the kimberlite. Uh, uh, your piping in the, in, the, uh, in South Africa or in, in, in most of the kimberlite source areas. The other model uh, is, is, is somewhat different. So their, their idea is to see, so what are the, uh, 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 how this, this particular exolution, because both this model consider that the exolution of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the volatile phase from the fluid phase is a necessary condition. Uh, to uh, to sustain the crack and 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 to, to sustain the crack so that the, uh, the the crack reaches the surface it allows the the continuous eruption of this high volume of kimberlite low viscous smell 
So uh, the Sparks et al. It considered they considered that there are three basic stages which are involved in the in the in the kimberlite volcanism. They in their stage one, the magma reaches the surface along some fissures, and this model have uh, have, have, have do not say anything about how these fissures are present or how these fissures would be developed in the in the in the vicinity of a magma zone. So this uh, sur uh, uh, stage one. It, it, it relates that the magma when reaches the surface along some pre-existing uh, your, your cracks or fissures, so it, 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 it violently explodes due to the content of the extreme high fraction of the, of the volatiles. And this particular stage is followed by the second step where the, 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 this part is somewhat similar to this earlier model. So this, once this volatile content erupts violently, along the surface so this leads to the erosion erosion of the pipe formation so that means the pressure is lowered once the pressure releases you can just imagine if we puncture a uh, kind of tire uh, the kind of uh, uh, dynamics that will that will go on in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the particular depressurizing tire tire so this is the something they have tried to explain so this uh, pipe formation will follow a similar uh, uh, dynamics that means with the release of pressure the, the, the whatever uh, confining pressure are present within the magma pressure, confining pressure not of the of the country dog, but rather the, the magmatic phase present along the along the fissure. So it will drop, and because of this, the it will lead to the formation of a diatrim or a uh, carrot separate uh, magmatic body. And when the most of the gas emits the velocity, so it it continues to uh, take away. The whatever pressure that was that that built uh, that was building uh, within the within the uh, this crater uh, initiated during the stage two, and during this stage two, the continuous emission of the gas it will it will slowly decline, and once this particular gas fully escape from the system, the pipe will widen along the along the uh, lateral extent, and this particular uh, widening and deepening of the what they call it as diatrim, it will form uh, the, uh, the, the volcanoclastic or, 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 or sin sediment, uh, sedimentary volcanoclastic deposits, kimberlitic brexias, that are associated with the, uh, with the, with the, with the uh, both the diatrim as well as the crater faces, which are commonly reported, routinely reported by, uh, by uh, all the uh, uh, people working in the, in the kimberlitic volcanism. And this stage four, there is another stage, stage four, so that has nothing to do with the with the with the, uh, with, the, with, the with the eruption, but this narrates that post this stage trip uh, event, the entire body, magmatic body, will suffer a hydrothermal metamorphism. Uh, it could be serpentination or some alteration because of the thermal cooling of the of the, uh, 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 of the deposited magmatic bodies. So, however, if you see both this model, although they are quite illegal in their in their boundary conditions. Uh, but but they lack a kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, information that tells us what are the stress conditions. So okay, like if we even have a, a, a formation of a fluid pocket uh, above a magmatic fluid column, it, it, we, we still need to have some model, some understanding about the stress localization that will kind of facilitate the further uh, uh, formation and, and progression of the of the tensile fractures that is required for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, your your volcanism so just uh, if we can quickly uh, see the, the 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 stress tensor so we can we can uh, we can dissociate or we can dissolve it into uh, the deviatoric stress component and the, and the isotopic stress component so so if you see the deviatoric part so the sigma 1 minus p so that that particular component so, so that the whatever stress, the tensile stress, uh, is required for the formation of the crack and their and their subsequent uh, sustainment of the crack. So, the particular tensile strength of the rock has to be matched with this particular value. So, if you now consider the P by hydrostatic pressure uh, in this equation at a depth of about 200 kilometers, so it is uh, uh, the strength of the rock is about uh, uh, your 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 0.5 kilobar. So, so that means, so considering a tensile strength of about 0.4 to 0.5 kilobar at, at this particular depth, so we need to have this particular stress conditions for the continuation or the generation of the, of the tensile cracking at the 
above or in the vicinity, close vicinity of a magma chamber. So to understand that, we did some numerical modeling. So, uh, so this was a finite element model approach that we that we use. So this is the model. So the black part is the is the magma chamber that we uh, that we idealize as a magma chamber. So, uh, so and, and we considered a, a Maxwell rheology. Of, uh, although some people have, in fact, uh, they have used a simple uh, elastic rheology, uh, considering the very small time uh, that is uh, that are normally associated with this very fast, ultra fast rather uh, volcanism. So, but we use the Maxwell rheology uh, to encompass the entire domain of the of the of the of the system. So, so we 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 uh, we. We, we use these particular uh, properties of the density and the elastic modulus as well as the other uh, uh, parameter of viscosity to model our uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, complete our model. So this is the magma pool. So we, we did two exercises. We thought that uh, 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 the geometry of the magma chamber, whether it could be a, a, a pointer or, or, or whether the magma chamber should have a particular geometry uh, so that the uh, tensile uh, crack can happen, and the second parameter that we that we that we investigated is the uh, the variation in the viscosity because uh, all the studies they they almost uh, uh, they 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 kind of converge to the point that we need to have a buoyancy effect. The buoyancy could be uh, by, by because of assimilation or whatever you assume. We need to have a uh, your your buoyancy effect. For the, uh, the, the, the buoyancy effect that will that will generate, in fact, the excess pressure in the in the magma chamber, leading to the formation of the fusor tensile uh, fractures. So these are the uh, model result. So that you can see that the localization of the tensile stress for a particular magma chamber it is maximum at the tip, and the tensile stress it it decreases as we go away from the uh, uh, from the tip of the magma tip uh, in a, in a towards the surface or in the vertical direction. So this is a pilot experiment, pilot numerical experiment that we did. Now, uh, with the first that, uh, that I was talking about, so we sense the density contrast between the uh, different uh, kimberlitic magmas and the surrounding rock. We kept the density of the uh, country rock constant because that is well constrained. Uh, but since there is no certainty about what could be the particular density of the, of the kimberlitic magma, uh, which probably is somewhat uh, something that I that I uh, discussed uh, in the in the uh, first few slides that the source characteristic of the kimberlitic magma is a still an open question. So we tried to exploit that uh, that avenue and tried to uh, see whether a particular choice of rheology in terms of the uh, its density whether it has got anything to do with the stress localization pattern around the magma chamber. So uh, as you can see, uh, if the density contrast is more. Uh, so when the density contrast is 200, the, uh, the tensile stress localization, it occurs at the, the place that was, uh, that, uh, that are most, uh, uh, that are intuitive in fact. So, but with increase of the density contrast, say from 200 to 400 to 600 to 800, so it continuously increases the, look, uh, the, 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 the generation of the tensile stress at the tip of a magma tip. So that means, so if you connect this particular result with this, uh, yeah, this, this, this theoretical understanding, then it becomes uh, clear that a particular density is necessary uh, to generate the particular amount of tensile stress at the magma chamber tip so that it, it, it can it, it, it exceed the total, ten, uh, not total, the tensile strength of the, of the, of the country rock. And unless the tensile stress develop around in the vicinity of the magma chamber exceed the tensile, tensile strength, certainly there will be no development of the tensile crack. So the, on the second part, we varied the chamber geometry because again, uh, many people have speculated about a diverse type of uh, magma uh, chamber geometry. So of course, the, the the one that is on the on the on the top left and one on the on the on the uh, on the bottom right. So if you see, these are the two uh, extreme uh, geometry that we considered. One is both are elliptical, if you see, but the long axis in one case has been is vertical. Uh, and, and, and on the other case, it, you can say the long axis is more or less horizontal. So uh, for a particular 
density contrast. So what we did, we did a good number of simulations for a particular magma chamber geometry by varying the density contrast. So for a particular chamber geometry, the density contrast need to have a particular threshold value so that the uh, that particular uh, 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 geological setting containing a particular uh, kimberlitic magma with a specific density and with a specific geometry of its store zone can 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 develop the tensile cracks at the tip so so these are the results all the results are almost monotonous in their uh, in their in their qualitative uh, uh, framework so you can see with a particular density uh, a particular density contrast with increasing the aspect ratio, the aspect ratio means if we increase the vertical extent of the magma chamber, the localization or the development of the tensile stress at its tip increases. So, so, so from this, we could uh, build up a, a very, uh, what we believe a very important result, uh, which, uh, which you can almost say as a field diagram that we can, uh, we can, we can reliably use to distinguish between the uh, two zones uh, nearby a magma chamber. So that means this particular plot, it shows that for a particular density contrast, uh, the two Susan parameters, the one is your density contrast, the other one is the chamber geometry parameter. And, and, and for a particular aspect ratio, for a particular magma chamber geometry, there has to be a threshold density contrast which will, uh, which will allow the tensile cracking of the country uh, rock to happen. A something below than that, the there will be no cracking in the in the in the in the, in the magma chamber and the kimberlitic magma although there could be production of magma chamber there could be generation of the magma chamber in, in a good amount of volume however the the the, the stress uh, uh, your 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 the, the, the stress uh, that is required for the formation of the tensile crack would be below that particular uh, limit and that will not lead to the production of the uh, cumulative magma. So this is something uh, that uh, that you can wonder whether this model can be can be explained to uh, somewhat explain or can be could be somewhat connected to explain the episodic generation of cumulative magma as a function of the continental breakup and the continental uh, that that super, uh, what is known as supercontinent cyclicity. So that means the stress pattern will continue to store. The particular uh, your your uh, pattern will continue to store the excess stress that is uh, that, that that will be derived by the far field uh, tech, uh, stresses generated by the by the by the tectonic events and when the situation reaches a suitable uh, scenario only that point of uh, time the crack will happen vertical crack will happen and it will uh, allow the magma the cumulative magma to start ascend. And once this the model uh, uh, the crack happens, so both this we can apply our our our, our result to kind of comply with both this kind of uh, well accepted uh, kimberlitic volcanism model. So we 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 uh, we also need uh, another experiment on the same line that where we tried to we intended to see what could be the stress localization once a crack forms. So, 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 and, 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 and just uh, once a crack forms, that means a dilatant tensile, a, 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 a crack will happen. The eventually, once this crack happens, because of the excess pressure, uh, which are present within the magma chamber, it will, it will push the uh, volatile phase at least to move upward and it will occupy the, it will first occupy that, that means the volatile phase will be the first candidate to occupy this, uh, this tensile, this, uh, open tensile stress, oh, sorry, sorry, this open crack. So when the tensile stress has just initiated, when it has just formed, then we can see that the, uh, the amount, that the magnitude of tensile stress localization is somewhat in the order so that it can sustain the vertical uh, movement or vertical continuation of the, of the uh, crack. But once it opens up, once the, uh, the, the whatever opening it, it it creates, and this cre uh, opening is filled up by the the, the fluid phase, whether it, whether it is volatile or magma, uh, the explanation at least from this model is going to be same. There it it, it 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 leads to a sudden drop in the stress localization at the magma chamber that you can see from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, scale that is given at the 
down uh, from the from the uh, the scale that is uh, given below. So that means once a crack forms and once it is filled up by the gas uh, or, 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 or 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 any magmatic fluid, so it will uh, it will kind of erase the movement. That means it will happen in an episodic manner and and something that has been advocated by most of the studies. So again, I'll repeat: it will it will it will the crack will happen. Stress localization would be would be would be uh, would be something that is all that, that, that is good enough to 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 to, uh, to continue with this fracture formation. It will open up. The fracture will uh, the stress will drop. That means the fracture can no longer uh, uh, move, uh, no longer progress in the vertical direction, and it will remain dormant until the stress uh, uh, until the excess pressure in the magma chamber reaches a critical value so that again it will it will it will kind of uh, generate the required stresses required for the further opening and a further progression of the tensile uh, tensile uh, crack however because of the lubrication of this crack the stresses that will be required in the subsequent stages is expected to be much lower than what is required at the during the just initiation uh, uh, event of the crack formation. So this is all I, I wanted to discuss today. So, so as an outlook, uh, I can only say that this particular uh, uh, magmatism of cumulative magmas, it has kind of, uh, it can be observed in almost all the catonic regions. And the, the, the and, and it, this model can be, can be instantly coupled with the cooling of the uh, cooling that was that that that, that is uh, routinely related with the or, or coupled with the poster can times uh, and and then this re, uh, resulted in a thermodynamic condition which which facilitated the formation and the uh, evolution of the kimberlitic magma uh, magma below a thick continental lithosphere. However, from a geodynamic point of view, the essential why this thick continental lithosphere is required. Uh, uh, for the formation of the of the of the or uh, 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 for the, this cumulative magma is still something that is not well understood, and uh, the, so there are new and emerging ideas that continues to uh, enrich our understanding about this very important phenomenon, about this very enigmatic and fascinating type of rock, which is particularly important from a geological point of view, that is because it acts as the uh, the the this uh, cargo of the uh, of the of the of cargo consisted of diamonds or whatever uh, uh, your lithospheric or mental xenoliths that it carries along with it. It offers a a a, a particular uh, a very very unique scope to the geologists to understand the uh, the the both past and the existing uh, not existing uh, no kimberlitic magmatism has happened in the last fifty million years. So so we can kind of uh, introspect the what was the kind of geodynamic environment at a say time gap of uh, at, a, at a time uh, at a time of say uh, say 50 million years and one with that happened with 250 or say 1 billion years before by carefully studying this uh, different types of xenoliths which are present in the in the in the uh, we, uh, which are found within the kimberlitic sources so that's all from my side